The narrative account, which we read in our lesson this morning from Kinjuja Love, paints a bleak picture of the state of marriage in our world today. Clear in its implication, the paper in the hand of the angel with its words, the marriage between good and truth, successively decomposes as the angel descends from heaven and approaches earth. It's a heavenly analogy, but it rings true today. And we live in a climate here today where there is almost total ignorance about the sacredness, the beauty, the innocence, and peace, and depth that characterize true marriage as defined in the heavenly doctrines for the new church. It's helpful to recognize how completely broken our culture's view today is in respect to its common perceptions about marriage. It's also useful to realize that the heavenly relationship described in the doctrines is significantly different from how people talk about marriage today. While people look for partnership in this world, the cultural definition for what that partnership looks like, its basis for operating, and its attributes are weak, they're temporary, they're often unappealing, compared with what the word for the new church teaches about conjugal love. Think for example, think for example about how the dominant world religions of our day speak about marriage. Christianity in general teaches that marriage only lasts during life on earth. The theology suggests that a person becomes sexless after death, and there's no concept of a spiritual marriage or any notion that men and women can live together as one to eternity. How can people find guidance and spiritual growth in that? Some Christian traditions take this even farther by expressing the view that celibacy is the ideal. Marriage then is only said to exist for the purposes of bearing children and for limiting desire in those who cannot maintain a life of abstinence while on earth. The dysfunction promoted by these beliefs is stunning. When one wonders about how such false beliefs can, how such false beliefs can contribute anything toward helping people live lives as human beings instead of animals. Of themselves, these beliefs do little to promote happy, lifelong relationships between husbands and wives. These definitions fall short because they define marriage as a purely natural relationship rather than a spiritual one. And with that, they miss, the, they miss the essence of what makes a true marriage between husband and wife. Promoting these false beliefs has caused profound ignorance, and it can be no wonder that our culture has been left to flounder about Without any spiritual guideposts, our culture is left to be influenced by tentative opinions and trends about marriage and sexuality that are inherently external and only physical in nature. Since there's nothing to anchor these in any sort of eternal truth, social mores about relationships are unmoored and they shift from one year to the next based on what theories rule the day about so-called healthy relationships. It's truly heartbreaking not only to observe the ignorance, but to see the waves of damage done as people blindly fall into behaviors that seemingly damage their ability to have spiritual relationships that are defined by our church that promise deep, eternal fulfillment. The heavenly doctrines characterize the essential problem this way. 
People are born natural. And with their inherently, inherently natural minds, they think natural and physical thoughts. That natural thinking that is locked in the dimension of time and space of this material world is incapable of its own of grasping the inner spiritual reality that lies within all human life. Only the Lord, only the Lord can raise people's awarenesses up and introduce them into this spiritual reality. It is in this spiritual world that conjugal love and its life exists. It descends into natural life as far as we are open to conforming our relationships in appropriate ways to receiving it. Of this we read, the Lord alone opens the internal elements of human minds and makes them spiritual and implants them in the natural elements so that they too take on a spiritual essence. This is what happens if people go to the Lord and live according to his commandments. His commandments are in some to believe in him, to refrain from evils because they are of the devil and from the devil, and to do good things because they are of the Lord and from the Lord, and to do both the one and the other as though one's own, and at the same time believe they are done through oneself by the Lord. The heavenly doctrines express tremendous hope that this true spiritually grounded marriage that draws from conjugal love will be fully restored among people living in our world today. We read, for example, that when Swedenborg was allowed to experience what conjugal love was like with people living in the Golden Age, that's among ancient peoples living before written history, his angel guide said to him this, I am sustained by the hope that the God of heaven, who is the Lord, will revive this love because it is possible for it to be revived. Later, Swedenborg himself echoes this hope after an interaction with angels celebrating the future of marriage, he declares, my heart leapt and I went home filled with joy and there returning from the state of my spirit into a bodily state, I wrote down what I had seen and heard to which I will now add this, that following his advent, the Lord will revive married love such as it was among ancient peoples, for married love comes only from the Lord and is found in people who are made spiritual by him through his word. Our hearts can leap too, because the Lord is reviving this love with the new church, and he offers it to anyone who turns to him recognizing him as their God, the God of heaven and earth, and who lives according to his precepts. Embedded in this hope is the point that the new church definition of marriage offers something completely different than our world's cultural external view of a marriage. When speaking of the ideal marriage, the heavenly doctrines are speaking about a relationship that is as different from the modern definition of marriage as heaven is different from earth. While well, one is time-bound and material in nature and focused on satisfying each other's present needs in the moment, conjugal love is a relationship that is based on its depth on its spiritual purposes that are reflective of the Lord's eternal purposes for the angelic heavens and by extension, the human race. It is defined by the Lord in his word. And so we need to allow those definitions that they're going to be different than how the world choo might choose to define marriages. 
That doesn't mean that there isn't helpful advice that can be used to improve communication in relationships, that can ease tensions, that can relieve day-to-day -day problems that we all experience in a shared life together. But there's very little outside of the new church that truly defines the internal soul and source of Kinjuja love and shows its orderly descent into the externals of worldly life. By definition, Kinjuja love is a life force that comes from the Lord alone. As such, it is celestial, spiritual, holy, pure, and clean, more so than any other love which exists from the Lord in angels of heaven or with people of the church. It is said to be the highest form of love that one can experience either as an angel in heaven or as a person living on earth. Kinjuja love is an expression of the Lord's love, which he in turn shares with couples. It's a gift that comes only from him. And so when one deeply reflects on this, one can see that couples receive Kinjuja love from the Lord alone in the measure or degree that they are connected with him. The closer a couple is connected with the Lord, the more open they are to receiving this most precious love and enjoying the delights of it in their relationship. So one cannot separate God out of the equation. For the life of a true and eternal marriage comes solely from him. The rationale for this is that Kinjuja love is a spiritual love. It is dependent on the interiors of a person's mind being open if it is to be received and experienced by human beings. Since people are born naturally, this opening of the interiors does not happen by itself. It requires our cooperation with the Lord and his precepts found in the word. Of this, we read that the interiors of a mind of the mind are opened by the Lord when people acknowledge him as the God of, hev of heaven and earth and go to him and this in those who live according to his commandments. The actual reason of this is that otherwise there is no conjunction, and without conjunction there is no reception. So from this we can see why the new church is a marriage church, and we can see why it is inseparably connected to its need to teach truths about conjugal love. To put it simply, it is essential for the spiritual health of the human race that our church clearly teach what conjugal love is and how people can approach the Lord to find it. If our church fails in this regard, where on earth would people find the path to this love? that is such an important part of human spiritual life. The heavenly doctrines put it this way. The human inclination toward marriage goes hand in hand with religion at every step. Every little step or stride away from religion or toward religion is also a step or stride away from or toward the conjugal inclination that is particular and proper to a Christian person. And then Swedenborg writes, at my asking what that conjugal inclination was, he said, it is a wish to live with only one wife, and a Christian person has this wish to the extent that he has religion. It is important to contextualize these teachings with the understanding that no person receives any love from the Lord perfectly. Every human being on earth is riddled with flaws and imperfections. 
Everyone is negatively influenced by inherited natural longings for evil. Nobody lives in an environment that is isolated from the flaws of others. And sadly, people can be deeply impacted by actual harm done by the destructive, corrosive forces of evil, either in oneself or in others. It's simply unavoidable in the culture that we live in. But that said, everybody, everybody can make progress toward heaven. And as we progress toward opening ourselves to Kinjuja love, despite our flaws and the imperfections of old, the Lord will lead us. The writings put it this way, no love can ever become pure in human beings, nor in angels. So neither can this love. But because the Lord primarily regards the intention that is in the will, therefore to the extent that a person has the intent intention and perseveres in it, to that extent he is introduced into the purity, holiness, and holiness of this love and he gradually makes progress in it. The Lord knows us. He knows our downfalls. As the human God, he understands our weaknesses and flaws better than we do ourselves. And yet he still loves us and desires that we are blessed in full measure by all of his loves. The Lord's mercy is everlasting. He is constantly working in the quietest spaces of our lives, leading us toward heaven. The doctrines teach clearly the power of the Lord, who with all his omnipotence is working to lead us toward heaven and help us experience conjugal love in a marriage which, where we will have an angelic partner in a relationship that will last to eternity. His careful, quiet leadership is manifestly clear in the descriptions of the intimate role that providence has in how people are prepared for a marriage, with each being led from infancy to eventually recognize the one that they were intended by the Lord to marry. We read, the, divine pro the Lord's divine providence is most specific and therefore most universal in connection with marriages and its operation in heaven because all blessings flow from the delights of married love like sweet waters from a sweetly gushing spring. It is therefore provided by the Lord that marital partners are born, that they are raised and continually prepared for their mar marriages and neither the boy nor the girl being aware of the Lord's gu guidance in that fact. We can recognize that the same force is at work in our lives. The Lord is constantly with us, preparing us, giving us strength, courage, and a desire to respond to him in ways that help us open spiritually so that we can receive the Lord's life. And this is especially true when it comes to receiving conjugal love, because this love is the highest, most precious form of life that can be experienced in human beings. Therefore, the Lord works more powerfully with this love so that it can be shared with us. So it is no different with us than it is with the young boy or the young girl who are continually being prepared and will one day meet and recognize that they are destined for one another. The Lord is working just as strongly in our hearts so that we can receive this love and that we can receive it to the fullest extent in the measure that we are willing to respond to the Lord and his life. The Lord does require our cooperation. He asks us to turn to him as the God of heaven and earth, 
and he asks us to do so according to his commandments, where we shun licentiousness and seek to do what is good. This cooperation is the beginning, and it's the basis of a spiritual marriage that is different in essence from any kind of relationship that's promoted in our time-bound world today. It's immeasurably better, it's sweeter, it's more innocent, it's more delightful because it's reflective of the eternal presence of the Lord in heaven. Through life in the new church, the Lord is now inviting humanity to enjoy the revival, growth, and development of love truly conjugal. He's inviting it into our marriages today by turning to the Lord and responding to him with a life according to his teachings, we can enjoy this growth, the growth of this priceless gem with its spiritual life, peace, happiness, and we can enjoy it to eternity in heaven. Amen.